in. Welcome, everybody. Good to see all of you. I'm really, really glad to see you today. We have one of our special community sessions, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from everybody. Um, this is a special session. Uh, every so often, we break our usual pattern. The usual pattern in the forum is that we have one or several guests, and we all talk with them about the future of higher education. But every so often, we put the guests on hold, and we all gather around the communal cyber fire, if you will, and we put our heads together, and we share what we're thinking about, what we're concerned about, what we're hoping for in the months ahead. So right now, I know it's blazingly hot for some of us, but I want you to think about cooler autumn, the soothing times of fall. And what is ahead for you as that fall semester draws nigh? What are you going to be teaching? What projects are you going to be working on? Are you making media or writing something? What are you concerned about? And what can we all do to help if you've got any kind of question or urgent need? So I have no agenda for this session. I have lots of ideas, but I really, really want to hear from all of you. So let me get this screen off. Let me just put myself on there just for a minute. And I'll actually add a little thing here. This is a fun thing, this little teal colored box. If you want to join us on stage and bypass me completely, just click the podium and you'll pop up on stage. Um, I've got to say, if I can start for myself, um, my fall schedule is is really packed. Uh, I've got a whole series of trips ahead. Uh, so I'm going to Mexico, I'm going to Germany, I'm going to Colorado, I think I'm going to Florida uh, for all kinds of speeches and uh, meetings. Um, I'm gonna be doing a whole bunch of virtual meetings, not as much as I'd like. Um, I'd rather be doing more of them. And I'll be teaching two classes. Uh, one class is an introduction to the program I teach in, Learning Design and Technology at Georgetown. And another one is my Technology Innovation Seminar, where we look at the history and theory of technology. And these are both great classes that I'm very, very excited about. And I'm running the forum. And I'm also going to be uh, writing and writing and writing my book on peak higher education. Um, Vanessa, I'm not sure when. Uh, I will definitely reach out to, uh, to you um, if that comes to pass and what the timing is, if so. Um, so this is a very, very, very busy uh, fall semester for me. What's on deck for all of you? Um, if, if you want to type in your thoughts in the uh, chat or if you want to hit the question box and just so I can flash your, your, your text on the screen, or if you want to join me on stage, just click the, uh, the podium button and we'd love to hear from you. And I, I'm just speaking about my own personal professional work. If you want to talk about other topics that are concerning you, uh, political, social, technological, cultural, um, please feel free. Uh, my good friend, uh, the hardworking and very, very thoughtful Peter Shea has right away uh, a really good thought. He's working on creating a third space, a third place of learning between the academic and workplace spheres. Um, Listen, I think you should uh, definitely uh, take a look at what Peter's up to. Uh, Amy K, I see you up here, but I see neither your video nor your audio. Um, why don't you uh, just reload the screen, reload this browser window, and um, make sure that uh, you click allow for Shindig to allow access to your microphone and your camera. I, I can't do that manually from here, which is probably a good thing. Uh, speaking of Wesson, who I'm, I'm just apparently exploiting the heck out of right now, they are gearing up for teaching some late summer, early fall natural dye workshops, including a six-hour intensive on working with woad. If you haven't seen these, Wesson, I don't know how much you want to share here, but Wesson's dye work is gorgeous. These are just incredible fabrics, so I, I, I really recommend it. Oh, Amy, no problem. I, I, I got you off. No problem at all. It's good to see you here. Um, yeah, um, and Peter, if you want to say more about um, about your third space, third place uh, project, uh, please just click the podium um, and uh, join us. If you know if your mic and camera are on and you feel up to it. Sure, Brian. Brian. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you just perfectly. I can see you with a white background. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, Hi. Good. Hi. Good to see you, Brian. Um, what I mean by a third place, some of you might be familiar with the sociological concept of the third place between work and, 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 and uh, home. And, um, you know, 
for someone who is particularly interested in the gap between academic and workplace learning, I, I've come to believe that we really need to create a space which is neither entirely academic nor entirely workplace that helps bridge the two spaces. And um, I think there's a number of things we can do, particularly now with AI, to help um, better prepare students um, for their work careers, um, mm. particularly in ways that um, traditional academics simply are not prepared themselves to do with students. Mm, mm, mm. I'm fascinated by this. My, I'm not a sociologist, but when I usually hear third place or third space, people often talk about uh, something um, that uh, is actually spatial, physical, you know, mm -hmm. uh, famously the bar and shears. For the example. bar and shear, right? The bar, the barbershop, that kind of thing. So yeah, in a sense, it, and it certainly could, could be a physical space. I think in in many colleges, the, um, the, uh, the prototype might be the Office of Career Integrated Learning, um, which is, you know, I think evolving from the older model that many of us knew into something slightly different. Um, and of course, I think it needs to because again, the workplace is changing um, far more rapidly than it did when many of us were in college. And much of our knowledge of how to function is terribly outdated uh, and we need to do far more. Obviously some colleges have co-op programs and that's a good start, but I don't think it's sufficient. I really think a new model um, uh, is needed to be developed and I, th I think one is emerging. Oh, this is fascinating. I mean, you're, you're doing this work in a community college, so that that relationship between classwork and employment is especially close. Yes. Um, but yeah. but because you're a community college, you have to do that. You have to make that relationship happen with fewer resources than anybody else. Right. With with uh, with a Dixie cup and string. That's right. That's right. Well, what's the what's the connection with AI in this case? Uh, I know you're you're doing a lot of great work in AI. Uh, are you are you thinking about that just in terms of how it changes the workplace and it changes academia or are you seeing it as a way of connecting the two well you know a good example of what i mean is um in a community college you have a lot of career oriented programs and there are of course there are uh essential uh course level objectives and what we call ksa's knowledge skills and abilities um which students are supposed to master um before they graduate so they can be very effective in the workplace. And um, with AI, it's much easier than it was in the past to build um, really good learning simulations in a short yeah. of time with minimal um, resources. And so what I'm working on is a repository of um, open simulations that are specifically aligned with course level and program objectives so that when students go to it, they can say, okay, I need to brush up on these, these competencies. Let me go to the simulation and, and do that. And, and, you know, and that can certainly augment what they're encountering in the, in the traditional classroom. Wow. That's a, and again, pretty soon the, in this, we get the idea that the, if, if we, if the AI is good enough and if we can prompt the AI well enough, then students can do this on their own. Right, right, right. We want to create resources that instructors can certainly make use of in the classroom, but not but they're not instructionally dependent, that the students can go to them on their own. Well, that, that would be ideal uh, in terms of empowering students for uh, for work. In, in, I don't know if you if you've seen this, Peter, in, in the chat, but there have been some um, some different responses. Our, our dear friend Sarah San Gregorio says that her building is very popular with students uh, outside of her discipline because they have small group places and larger open spaces. Right. Uh, and it's a building of, uh, I just had it, they have a nice atrium. I think I've been there. It's their business program, their business building. Um, and then um, they've got uh, uh, Greg Britton throws in uh, Robert Putnam's classic book from the 1990s, I think, Bowling Alone, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about the need for the kind of space. Right, right, right. And right, right. Uh, Dmitry Zakharov says that urban planning folks talk a lot about third places these days. Uh, in place of dead malls, we now have town centers. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, Dimitri, because the, the original idea for the mall, at least in the United States, was as a town center. Right. In, in a kind of almost utopian right. space. Right. Um, Peter, can I keep you up on stage for a few more minutes? Sure. I'd love to hear what you think here. Uh, and uh, and for everybody, you can tell this is a very, very informal uh, informal session. Um, the uh, Melanie uh, Hogue has something. Melanie, I'm going to have to beam you up on stage. 
because you're going to have to explain this. I, I think I'm just going to draft you up on stage right now against your will, because th this is too, this is just too great. Uh, she says that she's doing the Associate College of the South AI workshop. She's going to finish and deliver that. She's going to do an LMS and Google stuff set from prep to the fall, create and deliver AI sessions and chats for faculty, staff, and students, and the Polly the Duck project. Okay, I'm bringing her up on stage because I've got to figure out what Polly the Duck is. <laughs> Who is Polly the Duck, Melanie? All right, so do I have my microphone on? It's on. You're good. Okay. Uh, I thought that might grab people's attention. Um, <laughs> <I did. laughs> it actually has uh, hit the, uh, as far as the international news. Um, we have a faculty member who's involved with a, a wildlife rehabilitation center uh, north of mm -hmm. us here. And uh, they often receive non-wildlife um, drop-offs. So they received a, uh, a Pekin duck, which is the typical white duck that used domesticated duck, who had half of her bill missing, um, probably from a turtle attack. Oh, man. So she uh, talked, uh, since you volunteering there, and some of the folks there thought about this, that, and so on, and they wondered whether or not we can 3D print a prosthetic bill. So uh, she contacted me, because I'm the person overseeing, sounds terrible, of our makerspaces. And I said, well, I don't know, we'll give it a try. This is not a very common thing that's done. It is more commonly done with the upper bill only. Uh, however, her Polly's case, her upper, upper and her lower bill are both missing. So that's a little bit more of a challenge. So we, um, when I talked with them, I sure like, really like this to be a student project. So mm -hmm. I've got th uh, three students, now one graduated, involved in the project uh, for scanning, designing, mm -hmm. trying things out and so on. And I'm in the background. Uh, we have a dentist who is an alum uh, that's going to pro bono do the connection and so on. Oh. Um, and then we also got a, a, a few companies here in the area that are running fundraisers uh, for this and so on. For this, uh, for this one duck? One duck. Well, one of the things that we're doing is, and we do have some funds to uh, to pay for this, but one of the things that we may benefit coming out of this is we're doing, uh, using materials that are easily found, nothing really specialized and so on. So this would be potentially a method, a low cost method to maybe um, assist other um, animals that have some similar needs. There's very few, I found one company um, that actually uh, will print and do things prosthetic for different, mostly things like legs and so on, or the main part of the leg, hmm. or maybe turtle plates and so on. Hmm. But um, so that's the Poly project. It's been quite interesting. Um, and the pri primary student that's working on it doing the design this is liberal arts in action, is what I say. It is. Uh, he's a business major, international studies minor, oh. with an interest in 3D printing. Well, I was wondering about the connection. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, okay, first of all, Melanie, I just have to say that your normal autumn is like the typical autumn of five overworking normal human beings. <laughs> um, and, and and second, I, I love this project so much. Uh, Weston just found a... Uh, uh, a news story about this. I'm, I'm going to put this in the next FTTE report as an example of a 3D printing in, uh, in higher education. I, I, I love this so much. How, how you got all of that together? That's well, it's also the the university's uh, planning on uh, when their students come back. My student, primary student, is on internship this summer. Um, so when we get back reconnected together, um, then they plan on on when you do more formal documentary type thing and so on, what's involved with this. But I, one of the things I think it's a, it's a good example is I say liberal arts and if you know our mantra Padea, yes. uh, making connection you know, in, in action, yes, um, is a, to me a perfect example of what students can do and be exposed to, they would never have thought of. We all know more, much more about duck bill anatomy that we would ever have known about. <laughs> Um, and by the way, Polly is doing quite well with half of her meek. Uh, she's figured out how to eat. 
oh. um, and drink. But the primary thing, uh, if you're a duck, just so you know this, mm -hmm. is preening is very important. Right. Um, and she can't do that for part of her body. Oh. So the folks at the rehabilitation center do a lot of scratching and of her and petting, which she totally enjoys. Oh. And uh, Polly has adapted very well to be in the center. Well, I and hopefully not for much longer because she'll be able to go into yeah. In, into the yeah. wild yeah oh. and um well no she will not be permanently released no um yeah so because she's first off domesticated it's a domesticated duck it's not a wild duck yeah. right you mentioned that yeah. so this is her this is her home yeah it's her home she will always be at the rehab bill center probably also be one of their um, ambassadors well she actually already is um but again we have no idea how well this will um handle the stress and so on that she's yeah. That they, you know, dues. Um, the lower, in case you're curious, the lower uh, part of a duck bill is very much like your chin, lower chin. You have a lot of the soft stuff under there. It's not mm -hmm. solid. So as far as designing and printing, basically what was equivalent to our bony structure, and then how do we handle, what do we do with the flappy stuff that's under there? We, we haven't quite mm -hmm. figured that yet. So you, you might be creating Duck 2.0. Well, the bottom bill, definitely. The top bill is a little easier to do because it's solid and it's hinged. And she fortunately has the hinge part intact. Oh, good. Yeah. This is... Yeah. Um, Things you don't know you would learn about. <laughs> but, okay, well, well, well just two, two quick thoughts here. I mean, one, one, one is that uh, I, I've been talking with a lot of universities over the past year about universities as learning organizations yeah. I mean, not just that we that we teach and that we research but that we that we learn as part of our job yeah. uh, and this is a great example of that uh -huh. i mean it, it's the liberal arts multidisciplinary way we've got yeah. 3d printing we've got duck anatomy veterinary science i mean this is uh, mm -hmm. uh and there's a lot of depth to that uh, i guess the second thing is 3d printing is astonishing mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a long time booster of that and it, uh, just you know, just last week there have been some really interesting experiments with 3D printed rockets being used uh, for test firing. Um, I, I I love seeing these pop up in universities and colleges everywhere. Uh, where is yours in the library or is it in another building? Where our printers are located? Yeah, it's in a maker space you mentioned. Yeah, it's uh, we have uh, one fairly good sized room that's uh, dedicated for our printers. We have three of them. Um, we have a resin and two filament printers. One's a very large filament printer. Mm -hmm. um, and actually out of this project, we've received a grant uh, to replace um, the 10 year old Mac <laughs> that's driving everything <laughs> with Whoa. a brand new model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, well this, is, this is the best story I've heard today. Please give, <laughs> give the Future Trends forums uh, best regards to uh, to our new duck ambassador, and, uh, and and to your whole team. And thanks for coming up on stage and talking. Sure, about this. appreciate it. Thank you for the interest. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I mean, this is this is a, a freewheeling, free floating, organic session, and we get to hear from people. Uh, and we've gone from talking about AI and third places in sociology to veterinary science and three D printed duck bills, and now we have another thing to talk about. Uh, our friend in Malta. We have several friends in Malta, as one does. Uh, but Phil Lingard has this to say. He just came back from Beijing, where the 2022 clampdown on private educators seems to have wiped out tech ed tech entrepreneurs as well. Um, wow, that's that's really bad news, um, Philip. The uh, I know some of these entrepreneurs, um, and they were doing a lot of great work in a wide range of fields. Um, man, that's that's important news, um, and, and that's sad news, I think, for for uh, China. And for all the countries that are influenced by China along the One Belt One Road, um, thank you for that news, Phil. Um, Ed Ed Webb is here, and Ed Webb is not late. He is here exactly when he wanted to be. Uh, I'm glad to see you here, Phil. And Ed, um, and uh, Elena is l having less fun than Polly, but she's thinking about how to build or share resources for college staff when the institution closes. Uh, Elena, would you would you like to join us on stage and 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 talk about that. You can tell we're friendly and we don't require beards. Um, and if you can't, you know, please feel free just to use the, the text box or, or, or the chat box. Um, uh, I'm a, and while she's thinking about that, I mean, this is definitely uh, an important uh, topic to be thinking about. 
Uh, we've, as some of you know, we've been seeing uh, a higher than normal amount of American colleges and universities closing this year. The Heckinger report claimed that it was about one per week for a while, and that's still happening. Uh, so there's a real question of what do you do with the population that's impacted? Uh, I personally, I find a lot of the discussions are, are fairly dry or business focused. And they don't pay enough attention to the real human stories involved. But there's a lot of people uh, whose lives are negatively impacted when a college or university shuts down. Staff, students, faculty, as well as the immediate community. Uh, so, Elena, your, your idea of how to build or share resources for them, I think, is, is crucial. Oh, Elena, let me, uh, I'll just bring you up on stage, my own self. I'll just haul you up there right now from Emerson. From Emerson, continuing the, uh, we have that whole Boston theme going on, I see. Yeah, well, uh, as you probably heard, Eastern Nazarene is, um, is closing, unfortunately. Now, where is that? Oh, it's in Massachusetts. <laughs> um, Eastern. Yeah. Nazarene. Um, it's in Quincy. Mm -hmm. So not mm -hmm. too far from us. Um, but I, uh, um, Emerson, um, we're, we're the folks who, who took on Marlboro College yeah. after um, described by some as a merger. Um, and there's a future transform that uh, if you want to look up, uh, the former president of, of Marlboro was here and, Indeed. and he talked about his perception of what happened as well. So, um, but I was looking at it primarily from the point of view of libraries. Mm. Libraries are not, um, mm. you know, and we do have some stuff and it even goes back to the eighties. We have some literature about it. Um, but I had been looking at like the books that college presidents read about what happens when a college closes. And as you said, Brian, it's not very helpful in terms of if you're the staff. <laughs> um, so, you know, how do we build and share, you know, resources and sort of practical matters um, and issues and, you know, and I sort of wish in a way that there was kind of a, a FEMA-like organization that would, you know, sort of swoop Ooh. down with 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 prepared resources when this happens because it is a crisis. Um, and there's enough folks who have been doing this for long enough that um, I, I, I think there's a shared bank of, you know, potentially best practices. Yeah. Um, but I, I just, I haven't been able to find those resources in a, you know, comprehensive, easy to use way, um, you know, and very often the materials that are, you know, they're, you have to purchase them. And if you're a college that's closing down, you know, your not budget vanishes. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've been trying to work on that a little bit around the edges. I've cool. got, I've got other stuff going on this fall, but, oh, well, <laughs> but that was sort of the one I was thinking about. Well, well, first of all, I mean, uh, what else is going on for you? What, what does the fall of 2024 look like for you? Oh, well, we just switched library management systems. So that's always Whoa. fun. Yeah. Whoa. What, are, what are you using now? We're, we're, move, we're on Folio. We just mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. so. Well, good luck. Yeah, thanks. W was that your job? Were you writing herd on that? I, yeah, I'm the systems person. I, I didn't have to. We, we have a company and we work with a consortium. So okay, it wasn't cool. all on me, but a lot I of fun emails back and forth. Well, librarians, I think more than anybody else in academia or perhaps the world, uh, librarians collaborate more than more than anybody. You guys are just the ninjas of collaboration. Um, so that's that's a real strong point. Um, in the well, good luck, good luck with uh, the switch. Um, I'm sure it'll be it'll be excellent. Uh, Elena, in the in the chat, uh, folks have chimed in. Um, they uh, they uh, several of them zeroed in on Quincy and found links to it. Um, and uh, Peter Shea and Ed Webb uh, suggest that we should do uh, an article or a book. Uh, on this topic? I thought about doing a book, but the problem is it would have to be open access. Yes. <laughs> so, right? Like, yes. you can't sell that book. Actually, mm. I did a presentation recently, um, and, and I just put my bibliography in the chat. The title of my presentation is The oh. Last Book Your Library Will Ever Buy. <laughs> oh. um, right? Because it's that idea of, like, Whoa. what's the last book your library will ever buy? Right? Oh. Um, but it doesn't really work as a book. <laughs> Um, uh, no, that would be depressing for sales. Um, <laughs> I was trying to imagine pitching it to a publisher. 
Well, um, I mean, I'm writing a little bit about this in my current book, but um, but uh, it's it. Well, you're describing something that has so much depth to it, uh, and will vary. I mean, so Marlboro was you know a small private uh, campus, very very rural. Um, but some of these institutions are uh, public. Some of them are religious. Some are not. Some are in cities. Some are in the country. Um, and where they are originally makes a big difference too. Um, I know the state of Massachusetts. I, I'm going to garble this later, so if I get this wrong, please please correct me. Um, the state of Massachusetts had a law or a government function where if your university or college was having trouble, you could reach out to the state and they basically keep it quiet so that it wouldn't backfire on you. Uh, I, I think this came about because uh, Hampshire's president went public and said, you know, we're in trouble, we're losing money, someone please help us. And immediately enrollment dropped and, uh, and, and donations dropped and, uh, and it really, really backfired. Um, but the, uh, oh, there's a, uh, actually Greg uh, says uh, that Hopkins has a handful of books on mergers and closures. There are best practices, but most institutions start talking too late. Um, this would be a, a good time. Uh, Greg, if you want to put in a URL in, uh, I'm sure uh, people would be very interested. Um, there's a, actually a whole discussion here. I'm going to open that uh, podium again. If anyone wants to jump in, just, just jump on that teal box there. Um, Peter Shea mentions the Mount Ida debacle. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, and uh, Peter also gives the, uh, the time of the Closing Time Manifesto, which gives us a little echo of that third space again. Um, so, you know, that's... Uh, that's a thing here. I, I have one question for you right now, um, Elena, which is to do with the physical collection of libraries. Uh, I know there are businesses whose sole job is to help uh, libraries move. Um, so, you know, if they move across campus or if a collection is shipped, uh, is there actually a, a, a business here which uh, helps libraries close down and redistribute the content? Well, as you say, library collections are very different in terms of, of what they contain. So, um, and there is a question of if it's a merger versus, um, you know, the, the school shutting down. Sometimes, generally speaking, library collections, um, the first thing you have to do is consult legal because if it's considered a physical asset, mm. then you have to talk about it as a financial asset, uh, <laughs> and yes, whether you're yes, selling yes. it or not. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if it's a merger of two institutions, um, then sort of the the one that remains standing or the new one that's created out of it, you have to start looking about deduplication and things like that. Mm -hmm. And within mm -hmm. libraries, there are, um, you know, there are products and stuff that look at, you know, how do you, um, you know, look at collections and see what the overlap is and things like that. Um, you know, and, and also mm. looking at the value and the age of your collection and all kinds of stuff sure. like that. Um, it's very rare that an entire collection would, you know, as a single unit sort of get sold off or mm. give it to someone else or something like that. Special collections, usually the whole thing as a single collection would go, you know, to another institution for care. I bet, but a special collection is a small part of an overall collection. Well, it depends on what you're running, right? Um, I mean, it depends on your type of institution. In the, uh, in, in the chat, Greg uh, put in um, a link to one of their books. Uh, Vanessa shared a, uh, her favorite librarian blog with a great title of Librarian Shipwreck. Um, and uh, Annie Epperson asked something great, Elena. If uh, ALA or Library of Congress would be interested of host in hosting your open book, you say interested and capable. Um, you know, I wasn't going to say capable, but that is a question. Especially given the ALA's website, um, but but yeah, that might be a that might be a, a good project uh, to pitch to ALA or ACLR. Um, uh, wow, uh, we we just hit a, a and by the way, I like behind your right shoulder is I think a fire picture of a fire. Um, oh, behind my right shoulder, yeah. it's. Um. Sorry, we have a big media program. So this is Cinefax, oh, yeah. is the journal Cinefax, and this is yeah. the Terminator. I like well, robots. Even <laughs> more appropriate. <laughs> Man, I used to read Cinefax. Man. Yeah. 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 Wow. Great, great um, journal. I but that's it. a great uh, a great visual. Uh, Greg has shared a, a whole bunch of um, books. So as usual, the uh, Hopkins University Press is uh, is uh, on target for this. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, 
Now, on a related note in, in the chat, uh, our good friend Tom Haim says he recently tried to give away his father's scholarly library. He had no luck whatsoever, so it was broken up and, uh, and given away to uh, used bookshops, um, uh, which, uh, which breaks his heart, which is uh, understandable. Um, the, uh, um, well, this is something to, to, to really look for. I, Elena, if, uh, if you can get any traction on this, if you can find another librarian who's interested in the subject, please let me know and I'd be glad to do a forum just on this topic. Yeah, maybe, maybe I, I didn't mean to bring everyone down in fall. That's kind of <laughs> what I was thinking about. But we, you know, well, and thank thank you so much for everyone who's who's uh, contributed stuff. I'll I'll go through my the the Zotero um, that I have and see if if there's more stuff I need to add there. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're using Zotero, of course. And um, Elena, don't you apologize? I I explicitly said this is for our hopes and our fears. Uh, and fall is, of course, as Calvin Hobbes said, you know, the great natural fireworks. But it's also sad. It's a it's a time of decay. Um, I'm just glad that we can talk about it with friends on this third space, as Andrew says. Thank you, Elena, and good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Um, in the in the chat, there's just a, a whole bunch of good questions, except for George Station, who's trying to scare me um, by saying it's cautionary tile for you, me, and all our bibliophiles. Uh, absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, Listen, uh, we had an, another question come up. And I, I just love how how diverse everybody here is thinking, the, the, the different topics, the different situations, the different plans we've got, everything from AI in third spaces to 3D printing a duck bill uh, to talking about libraries after closure. And now we have a, a whole different topic. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, improvise this, Stephen, but Stephen Crawford, please, please correct me and join me on stage if you'd like to. Uh, Steve is looking at a uh, bill, not, not a duck bill, a legal bill uh, that's coming up in uh, Arizona in Maricopa County. Uh, and as far as I can tell, Stephen, this is one uh, which it's called Delivering Flexibility to Strengthen and Expand Educational Opportunities. Uh, but it sounds like it's actually a limit on uh, it's a it's a cap on funding. Is that right? Yeah. So. Um... And I have to be careful what I say since I work for, you know, since this is a, a, uh, yes, a, a ballot initiative, but understood. and so I'll be quoting the website. It's so essentially in 1980, uh, Arizonans decided that, hey, we're going to have expenditure limits on all taxing districts. And mm -hmm. so there was this magic formula that they created and has been in effect since then. And so what you'll see a lot of K-12 districts will almost every year or every couple of years ask for. Uh, an exception for the next couple of years on the expenditure limit. And so that is a traditional thing that we have here in Arizona. Uh, the community colleges are facing a very similar problem now. And uh, one district uh, has already changed their expenditure limit formula permanently, and they may not have changed it enough. And so they may have to go back and, and ask for another change. This is our first request at changing uh, the limit. And essentially, when you get down to it, the bottom line is, is that uh, we're just trying to change our base uh, expenditure limit with the, uh, permanently with this with a change in the formula to recognize new values from because as the website will point out, a lot of things have changed since 1980. A lot of costs have changed, like yes. gallon of gasoline, uh, minimum wage, things like that. Sure. Um, if it does not pass, uh, while the tax rate won't change or anything, we'll be forced to cut $100 million in expenses, which is about oh. one third. Yeah. Yeah. One third of our expenditures for a 10 college district. Oh, wow. That's, and that, to make, that's fatal. That, that's and to make, that, make things even more interesting, our county uh, treasurer's office miscalculated tax revenue over a bunch of years uh, for certain things. So we're now required to give back $44 million, uh, at some point soon, and we're charged interest for every year that we don't. Oh, how, I, I got to ask, I haven't been there for, oh gosh, I think 12 years or so. How's Maricopa County doing financially? I mean, is, is the area booming? Is it stalled? What's going on? Well, I mean, I, I think you were out here actually uh, about a summer or two ago for a different conference because uh, I almost because I was associated with them up in North North Phoenix. And yeah, that that area did not exist uh, 10 years ago. Uh, it is it has been slow growth, but it's been growth. Um, we're beginning to hit different walls. But 
you know, people are ignoring the fact we may run out of water. So there are some water right. rules. Our growth is so strong in the West Valley that it is just completely uncontrolled out there right now. And they're ignoring water rules. Um, so oh, that's not so the bad. issue. It's just the, the fact that and we have so much great tech going on here with Intel oh, yeah. and, and, and we have a, a chip plant being built in the West Valley. So there's a lot of great. In fact, Biden and the Secretary of Education and even Jill Biden have all been coming out here touting this new chip plant that mm -hmm. uh, our mm -hmm. that our colleges are helping to train the, the folks who are going to be working there soon. So, Excellent. I mean, Excellent. we've got great opportunities, but the problem is we're looking at a potential one third budget cut if if the voters don't recognize this. Uh, in, in the chat, Tom Hames says it's nice to live in a swing state. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you 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 get that investment. Um, I get it. That one third cut is 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 horrible. But I, I I mean, just just thinking about how college and universities have changed since the nineteen since nineteen eighty. I mean, it, you could be really practical and say how many jobs are now in higher ed that didn't exist or yeah. at scale. I mean, think about IT departments. You know, uh, I know Arizona state politics is tricky, but you have you know people whose job it is to work with state government, regulatory compliance at the federal level. Uh, reaching out to the community for partnerships with businesses. Uh, my gosh, not to mention your enrollment is probably what four times what it was in 1980. Um, yeah, probably. I say it's gone up quite a bit, and then it's dropped a lot since the recession. But and especially yeah. since, but it has been going up since uh, the pandemic. So, and you know, and and one of the things that this does is it changes how you approach problems. So we have a lot of things that we have been working on that are on hold because we're afraid to spend sure. money and commit money on a three-year cycle because we don't know if we'll be able to pay that money next budget. You know, this budget year is fine. What happens next budget year is a whole different story. How can you hire, you know, a person for a six-year project or a build? No, no, no. How can you sign a contract for uh, an IT system for three years? What's the, what's the timeline on this? So this is going to be on the November ballot, okay. uh, which will be awesome. And uh, from what I'm told, the ballot will be four long pages. <laughs> so we're going to be buried in there. We have a lot of initiatives going on. I think we're right after a tax hike uh, uh, initiative. So that should be awesome. Uh, so, uh, Steve, if um, I don't know if there's anything we can do, um, at the very, very least, if you want to email me any news or updates about this, and I can spread the word through social media at, at the very least. Um, I don't know if we could do a forum session on it. Um, I'm just making this up. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm um, not sure. Yeah. It, it, that's a good question. It's like, I know there is a, um, there is a political action committee that is completely separate from us who is handling those types of things and have, and handling the, the promotion uh, side of things. Uh, legally, all we can do is educate. And so that's, you know, that, that's as about as far as I can get unless right. I am off hours at home on my personal computer, not using any resource, you know, all those things. In which case, I'd be glad to hear from you. Yeah, so we'll definitely, I'll have to send some stuff to you after hours and uh, as, as I as things progress. But uh, it's been really interesting because, you know, at, you know, when you look at colleges, what, from what I have been told is 80% of our expenditures go to people. That's I mean, difficult. when you consider staff and faculty and all of the support that goes on in higher ed today it has changed so much since 1980. And so you were talking about the human cost with the libraries and such. That's just, that. That's the reason that was the trigger. Is like there could be a potential human cost here as well. Well, my, so. my my usual joke is higher education is very much like soil and green. We're made of people, right? Yeah. And that's that's our biggest budget for every university and college that's out there. Um, yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's a um, there's a lot a lot to be a lot to be said about this. If again, if I get email from say someone called. Schmeven Schmorford, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, but good luck. And uh, man, this is a uh, oh, one quick question came up from yeah. uh, from the chat. Um, uh, Ed Webb says, "Aren't the Saudis using water out there to grow alfalfa or something?" That is a correct statement. Our governor has been questioning that problem, and I'm not. Sh I'm trying to remember off the top of my head if she's been lucky enough to stop that or if it's still ongoing. But yes, there are uh, there are large alfalfa uh, farms out here that immediately ships to the uh, Saudi Arabia. Wow. So you have an export. Yes, we do. Uh, so that's uh, so Ed. Thank you for catching that. Uh, your your Middle Eastern experience is is is, is keen eyed here. Um, 
uh, Stephen, good luck. And, and thank you for telling us about this. Oh, yeah. Thank and, you. Of course. Um, listen, uh, again, the topics that we're covering, what we're thinking about is, is really, really diverse and interesting. Higher education is, is this complex, is this rich, uh, this global. Uh, so not only do we have the Saudis, uh, Phil from Malta was telling us about Chinese higher education, technology, entrepreneurship. Uh, but now our good friend, uh, George Station, uh, has a topic to bring up. Uh, George can't join us on video right now, so I'm just going to you know, um, you know, read it for him. Uh, he says, has the future of academic conferences been discussed? He's thinking about a host of smaller conversations about lack of general support for disability, uh, those who are immunocompromised, etc. He, he adds, it's not a new problem, but it's exacerbated in recent years. Uh, uh, George, I would love to do uh, a session on that topic, uh, if we could find some people that are interested, and we probably can. The um, uh, I've been thinking about this topic for a couple of reasons. Uh, one has to do with COVID, and I was really surprised at how quickly academic conferences and meetings went right back in person uh, really, really quickly. Um, but also thinking about this in terms of uh, climate change. Uh, again, I, I began this hour by talking about my trips, and one of the reasons I greet them with a sigh is because these are trips I have to fly for. Uh, rather than either do virtually or take a train for. Um, uh, Annie uh, Epperson points out that uh, there's a problem of reduced travel funds for faculty to register or attend face-to-face. -face. Uh, Annie, is that in, in general or just for your institution? Um, Sarah Sangregorio uh, said, points out that her experiences with virtual conferences have been mixed, unfortunately. Uh, same here, same here. The, uh, I, I hope to, at some point, put out an ebook on how to do that well. Um, I think we know how to do it well. It's a question of actually you know, doing it correctly. Uh, Ed uh, reminds us that the International Studies Association has a virtual conference every other summer. Um, he participated last year. It was good, but his sense is it was less prestigious than their traditional conferences. Interesting problem, interesting problem. Um, that reminds you kind of of publishing ebooks as well. Uh, Annie Epperson says you were frozen last year Ah, interesting. Good luck. Lisa, why why do you prefer virtual? Uh, you say you've always preferred virtual. Why is that? Uh, Peter Shea adds that uh, inflation makes uh, conference travel often unaffordable. Quite true. Quite true. Um, and uh, Chad Fulton says, have you experienced recent Amtrak delays due to overheating of infrastructure? Yes. Just the other week, I went to North Carolina and back on Amtrak on the Carolinian line. And uh, both ways, uh, there was severe heat. So if, if you haven't heard of this, this is when the, the, the rails themselves, the actual metal rails you know, stuck on the ground, uh, heat up so much from exposure to sun uh, that they actually expand a bit, which means that the trains have to slow their velocity going through them or else risk wreckage and overturning. Uh, Chad, I did learn that in some countries, notably Italy, they actually make a point of painting the tracks white in order to reduce heating, which I think is brilliant. Um, Lisa, if I can connect what you said to something George said, Lisa says she doesn't like crowds, and it's quite understandable. I mean, you think roughly about a third of the human race counts as introverted on the Myers-Briggs typology. Um, you know, the, and extroverts like myself get to run the world, and, and that's a problem. Um, so if it's just you and your laptop or your tablet or your desktop, then you don't have that problem. And there are other reasons, too, to not like crowds, uh, all kinds of reasons, uh, from neurotypical uh, issues to or neuroatypical issues to uh, previous experiences in life. Um, Steve Crawford adds the experience, the, sorry, the conferences that he participates in are experiencing a drop in attendance. Are those face-to-face -face or, or online? Uh, while he's answering that, he also said, conferences are difficult because we are required to participate in remote meetings back at home to make it difficult to immerse in the conference. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, that's interesting. I wonder if this is where where VR and XR really come in handy, where you know the headset or the goggles or the glasses uh, blot out part of the world around you um, and it makes it more immersive. Uh, George um, asks a really good question. Campus budgets and travel don't seem to go together. How are tenured faculty feeling this? More pressure to go find your own funds? He's a lecturer, and he's always begging anyway. Um, that's a really good question. 
Uh, I don't have a good answer for that offhand. Uh, I have seen um, more than a few events basically requiring travel and not supporting travel. Uh, so I think assuming you know that uh, that the people will be able to put that up themselves. Um, Steve Crawford answers that his the the dwindling attendance he was experiencing was face to face, uh, and I think that's that's a, a major issue. Um, uh, online seems to be doing well. Elena goes right to my heart here. Elena O'Malley says, if you're a caregiver, in-person conferences are harder. Absolutely true. Uh, it's really hard for me personally to travel right now, uh, in part because of that. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's very hard to finance that. And yeah, a virtual conference is a lot better for that. Um, and Vanessa points out, uh, you know, it's got to be virtual for her. I mean, I, I find virtual conferences tend to get a lot of people who normally couldn't get there. Um, I, I find younger people, I find students, uh, and uh, people who are doing something else. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Andrew Zubiri, a uh, great student um, from Georgetown, now up in uh, the Boston area with the Boston Mafia, says he attended the Association of Writers and Writing Programs online, and the pre-recorded sessions were limited. Only a few sessions are hybrid. I guess you get what you pay for. Well, that's interesting. So having pre-recorded sessions as well as live sessions. Uh, George, uh, who initiated this topic, says that caregiving has increased as a priority for all on campus. He's at a California State University campus. People aren't saying no to family as they were pre-COVID. Hmm, interesting, interesting. Uh, Deborah Penner says that she likes virtual conferences because it makes it easier to attend. Um, yeah, true. And Elena says she likes un in person, but they're harder. I, I I often think about movies for this. Uh, I'm a movie fanatic. I, I love watching movies. And for me, the best experience is seeing a movie in a good movie theater, you know, with excellent sound and, you know, good projection and all that, I mean, you know, IMAX and so on. Um, but most of the time, I don't do that. Most of the time, I watch a movie in my bedroom or on my laptop in the house. Um, because I, a lot of the movies I see, I want to see, are not playing the big screen, or it's just not logistically right. Plus, seeing them at home or on your machine is a lot cheaper, whereas going to the you know, theater is a significant cost. Um, so it, that I like that comparison a lot. It may be that we reduce the number of face-to-face -face events and make them like the theater. We make them a really great experience, but we do more and more uh, online that way. Uh, Peter Shea adds another wrinkle to this. He likes in-person conferences that are local. Uh, Peter, I think, I don't know if Ed was talking about this. Uh, I've written about this before. Ed, there was another group, I want to say it was an anthropology group, and what they did was they took their international conference and split it in two so that all the international presentations were pre-recorded videos as, as papers uh, put on their website and that all the in-person meetings they did locally and I think local was like Europe or Japan plus Korea or the United States. I think um, as a as a you know as a twist on that. Um, oh, Annie gives. Oh, oh, Greg Britton points out, in-person conferences are invaluable for publishers, but very expensive. Virtual meetings are worthless for publishers. Wow, Greg, that's interesting. There's got to be a way of of boosting connections and sales for for those right now. Um, and you know we we do our best here in the forum as well. Uh, Annie Epperson adds a really crucial point. Uh, her deepest concern is issues of safety. How do we ensure that folks who attend a debate between candidates, oh political candidates, I'm sorry, I got it, uh, are safe and to what our campus response might need to be if Trump prevails? Um, Annie, uh, I don't know if I can multitask this in uh, right now. Um, this is an incredibly important point, and this is one that I was hoping to mention. Uh, I think right now, as a futurist, I think the odds are pretty good that we have a second Trump presidency. Uh, and I think it's important to prepare in academia for what that might mean. Uh, so I've started a few different projects about this. Um, and uh, here, I'll put in a, a quick link here to my, to my blog on this. Um, uh, I think we need to uh, pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, I'm starting a reading of the Project 2025 book. Uh, we'll be doing uh, at least one Future Transform session on it. 
uh, any if there's anything else um, that we can do, please, please um, let me know. Uh, and this is for everybody. Um, you know the uh, and she's describing uh, uh, an incident when Trump came, uh, and this is when he was in his first year as president, Annie, uh, and how they divided the campus and left people uh, uh, traumatized. Uh, Greg Britton adds to this: Will we see a return of the encampment protests? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we we might see that. Um, Oh, thanks, Andy. Uh, either as the Gaza, if the Gaza war continues, and if there is uh, support for encampments that could return, but also perhaps encampments will morph to being uh, opposed to Trump um, uh, after November, depending on again on the election happens. Uh, Deborah Penner says that she's concerned about candidate rallies. I'd never bring a kid to a rally, even for a local candidate. You know, that's. Uh, that's a really good point. Um, safety for this, especially given the attempted assassination of Trump, uh, which is the sentence that I didn't really think I'd be saying um, ever. Uh, this is something we have to be really, really concerned about. I mean, crime rates are dropping, but political violence may definitely increase. Um, we are uh, almost, almost out of time. Uh, we have covered a, a lot of, of material. Um, I just want to uh, just give people a few more seconds or, or a minute more to uh, say what they're thinking about this. Um, the uh, oh, I should probably if I said this too quickly, forgive me. Um, uh, Annie and Vanessa are talking Project 2025. If you haven't seen this, this is a project initiated by the Conservative Heritage Foundation, and the centerpiece of it is a 900-page book. I haven't seen it in print. I've only uh, read the ebook. Uh, which is a guide to a Trump administration on how to uh, change the government uh, in order to enact as many of the Heritage Foundation's conservative ideas as possible. It's a very, very detailed blueprint uh, right now. Um, and uh, the Trump administration has distanced itself from that, but uh, some of us are skeptical about that since a lot of the authors of the book are from this previous administration. Uh, Vanessa says the possibility of looms over all of us and how might high ed respond to it? So, Andy, I'm hoping to find a couple of political scientists or government professors uh, to help us frame that out um, and uh, for a forum session. And we'll be reading this uh, online uh, on the on the blog. The uh, uh, first um, blog post about this is going up on Monday. Uh, George Station adds, a current course is about social change, whatever lens you care to use, or about to get more scrutiny. So, of course, like Turning Point, you're more organized. I agree. Uh, in the short term, George, I expect the turning point to be very, very active this fall. Um, and Mark Colbert Wilson says, you know, there's a professor of government around here who we could use. Ah, I can't use names like Stom or somebody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Vanessa makes the very, very excellent point that high red folk need to think about cooperation with allies outside academia. Tricky to do, as Stephen Crawford just described. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are we just rushed past the top of the hour. I imagine we're all sitting around perhaps a gigantic uh, dinner table or perhaps at a bar, a third place, uh, where we are um, drinking beverages of choice. Uh, fire is crackling, there's music playing, and we've been putting our heads together uh, as friends and allies and colleagues. Um, I'm astonished at how much we've talked about in just you know, 56 minutes or so. Uh, everything from 3D printed 3D printed duck bills uh, to talking about politics at the local level, the county level, to the national and international level, to thinking about what happens to libraries, to the future of conferences. Friends, one of the reasons I love doing these forums is because all of you are a gigantic distributed open brain trust. Uh, you are so brilliant. You know so much. You are working in so many different directions. Um, I'm just so glad to have all of you here uh, together. Um, I'm trying to say nice things and people in the chat are just going bonkers right now. Um, we definitely have to do this as a topic coming up. Um, but we are, uh, I'm afraid, out of time. We are at the end of the hour. So I'm gonna have to wrap things up. Um, the uh, Sarah, please take care. Um, would it help if we did a session on that kind of uh, healthcare, on uh, a session on trying to help academics not overstress and not have problematic heart rates. Um, let me know, 
and I, I can see what we can do. Um, Tom, in all seriousness, we love you in every session and, and your professional expertise here will be very needed. Uh, Deborah, I'm so glad um, and thank you. I'm really glad that these work for you. Um, Lisa mentions the disco duck. I knew you'd come up with a joke. I knew you would do that. Um, and uh, uh, Vanessa, they're not silos. They are cylinders of excellence. Um, so let me, let, thank you, George. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, wrap things up a bit here. Um, I know it's sometimes hard to transition from a virtual synchronous meeting like this to an asynchronous medium like social media. If you want to, though, if you want to keep sharing these ideas, uh, I've got a footprint in every single social medium right now, uh, except Instagram. I, I use it. It just doesn't seem to have anything to do with my professional work. Uh, so there you can find my handles on Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky, uh, as well as my blog. Um, we have a whole bunch of topics coming up. Um, and if you want to look at the, where they came from, we have our whole archive on YouTube. Uh, sessions, we're talking about illiberal universities, which I think is a connection with uh, JD Vance. Sessions about enrollment, which really, really matters a great deal. How to reform grading, and of course, preparing for Trump, and what the future workforce is like, uh, which again, Peter Shea, this is something that matters a great deal to you. Um, let me pause here. Uh, thank you all uh, for all these thoughts. Um, I would love to hear more. Uh, if you want to hear, if you want us to hold more of these community sessions, um, please let me know. Uh, I'd be glad to do that. Um, and in the meantime, everybody, uh, please take care of yourself. Be safe. Keep doing this great work. If you're here in the in the in the raging heat countries, stay cool. If you're in the northern countries, enjoy the last bits of summer before fall sets in. Uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor to do all this thinking and being with all of you. Take care, friends. Bye-bye.